Hi, I'm Stephen with AlbertaUrbanGarden.ca. So far in the biochar trial, we've shared a number of lab results, including the no significant change in the pH and the fact that the biochar bed held more phosphorus and nitrogen than the control bed did. Today, I'll be sharing some more lab results that put biochar's number one claim to the test, namely, that it in fact prevents leaching, meaning there's higher concentrations of trace elements in the soil. And we'll also evaluate whether or not those higher concentrations, if they exist, make the fruit grown in them more nutrient dense. In order to test these claims, we've sent in soil and tissue samples for trace elemental analysis. But first, I'd like to recap the basic trial setup before we get to the results. Before the beginning of the field trial, enough biochar was set aside to amend the test bed with a half pound of biochar per square foot. This biochar was thoroughly blended with twice the volume of compost, plus enough chlorine-free water to give the mixture the consistency of a wrung out sponge. This process, known as charging, loads the biochar with water and nutrients and inoculates it with microbes. The biochar was charged for 14 days before beginning the trial. We set up identical garden beds for both groups and filled them with compost and worm castings. The amount of compost added to the biochar bed was reduced by the amount that was used to charge the biochar, thereby ensuring an equal total amount after the addition of the charged biochar slash compost mix. Equal amounts of worm castings were added to both beds. The compost came from a single pre-mixed source to ensure consistency and the purchased worm castings came from a single batch number. Regulatory requirements require these products be analyzed prior to sale, and within a single batch, variations in the products must be below the detection limit. We felt that these measures provided sufficient assurance that the base growing medium was consistent in both beds. A viewer selected which bed would be the biochar and which one would be the control. The charged biochar and compost blend was then mixed into the soil in the bed. No additional amendments were added to the control bed. All three of the beds received the same treatment throughout the growing season, including watering, mulch, sunlight, and the same variety of crops were grown in the same location in each bed. Common critique of our biochar field trial is that the biochar is more efficient in poor soils and therefore should be tested in poor soils. However, biochar products are being used more and more in home organic gardens, which typically are rich in organic matter and nutrients. So our hope is that the trial will provide valuable information to these gardeners that will help them determine if biochar amendments will provide great value in their gardens. That said, as part of our ongoing studies, we will be testing biochar in poorer soils in 2015. So let's return to biochar's claim that it holds nutrients, preventing leaching. This could have some big implications for fertilization requirements. Overall, if it's holding them, it may in fact allow you to decrease your fertilization requirements. To test this claim, we measured the nutrient availability and trace elements from soil in biochar and the control bed. We also submitted pepper tissue samples, trying to see if Growing in a more nutrient-rich soil would make the pepper itself more nutrient-dense. Soil samples were taken from the same location in each bed, generally outside of a major rooting zone. The mulch layer was removed and the first few centimeters of soil moved aside. The samples were taken and placed in a cooler immediately. We chose peppers for the tissue analysis as they are the most commonly referred to in the literature. The peppers were picked the same day at the same ripeness. The samples were then placed in a jar and flash frozen. The soil and tissue samples were brought to Maxim Analytics for analysis. In order to move through the results quickly, I'll speak about the microelements essential for plant growth. All the results below are in milligrams per kilogram. And in order for the results to be statistically different, a general rule of thumb is that they have to be more than 10 times the detection limit. The detection limit can be found on the right hand side of the analysis. All of these numbers are totals, reflecting both the available and unavailable elements in the soil. 
The biochar bed had nearly one and a half times the calcium as the control soil, with 33,000 milligrams per kilogram, to the controls 23,000. There was 30% more sulfur in the biochar group, with 3,600 milligrams per kilogram, to the controls 2,800. Iron was 40% higher in the biochar bed, with 14,000 milligrams per kilogram, to the controls 10,000. Magnesium was also much higher in the biochar bed, at 8,600 milligrams per kilogram to the controls 5,500. There were no significant differences in the levels of boron, copper, magnesium, molybdenum, nickel, and zinc. This evidence, with the prior lab results showing higher phosphorus and nitrogen concentrations, does support the claim that biochar holds on to more nutrients, likely through the prevention of leaching. For home gardeners who already have soil that is rich in organics and nutrients, it's important to note that these numbers are all in surplus, both in the control and the biochar bed. Therefore, biochar may not be adding as much value in healthy, rich, organic soils. As mentioned before, we plan on testing biochar in poorer soils to see its potential impact in 2015. So does having more nutrients in the soil result in higher nutrient density food that's grown in it? Let's take a look at the lab results to find out. The lab results indicated that there was no significant differences in the following elements in the pepper tissue results. Calcium, magnesium, boron, iron, manganese, zinc, copper, molybdenum, and nickel. These are all of the essential elements for plant growth. So as suggested earlier, Having more nutrients in the soil does not necessarily mean you're going to get more nutrient-dense produce. And this is likely to do with the fact that it's in surplus. If it's in surplus, it's going to take up what it needs and it's going to leave the rest. So as I said at the beginning of this video, the lab results address the core claim of biochar that it holds nutrients in the soil. As you can see, these results do support that. So if you're growing in poor, nutrient-devoid soils, biochar may in fact be able to help you retain some of those nutrients, overall lessening your fertilizer requirements. However, if you're growing in soil that is rich in nutrients and organic material, biochar is not likely adding much value, as described by the pepper tissue results. That said, we'll continue the trials for at least another two years to see if this nutrient retention plays a greater role in our organic soils. We'll also be adding a poor soil trial bed in 2015 to test how biochar performs in poor soils. We'll have the soil again analyzed next year and a wider variety of plant tissues. I suspect this topic may generate some discussion. I would love to see what you have to say in the comment section below. If you missed last week's surprising rock dust results, there'll be a link in the description as well. If you would like to take a look at the actual lab results, I've posted them on my website. I'd like to give Maxim Analytics a special thank you for not only helping us run these samples, but analyzing them as well. Patrick Dolan of One Yard Revolution was instrumental in bringing this episode to you today. If you haven't already, I highly suggest checking out his channel. For other related videos to the trials, there'll be links in the description. Thank you for spending time with me today. I appreciate it very much and I hope you have a fantastic day.